there. Welcome into Fantasy Baseball today on Thursday, April 11th. I am Frank Stanfield, joined by Scott White and Chris Towers. The gang's all here together again today on the show. Rankings, risers, and fallers. Cody Bradford continues to impress. Jackson Holiday made his debut. And let's have a conversation about Tanner Bybee and Nolan Jones. Knock on wood, not trying to jinx anything, but we actually get to start a podcast with baseball and not injuries. That is a beautiful sight and sound. I love it. I don't believe it. My, oh, my. I, 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 I love oh, my. I loved how, you know, when, when you and I did the last podcast for, what was it, uh, Tuesday morning, Frank, we were like, okay, maybe maybe we can go a day without pitching injuries. And there was, what, three? <laughs> three? <laughs> yeah, the very next day. I wasn't there to react to the three, but yeah, no. <laughs> no pitching injuries today. Hooray. Yep, yep. Uh, we'll see what tomorrow brings. All right, players of the night. Scott, you are up. All right. With your Who... guy else would I pick other than Vinny P, baby? Baby! There you go. By far his best game of the season. What had been, you know, one of the he had been one of the uh, most disappointing hitters so far, I think is fair to say. Entered Wednesday with only four hits. Well, he added three here on Wednesday, including a homer, including a double, Drove in five runs. He, uh, I think it was like a 15-point game in head-to-head points leagues. Very big day for Vinny Pasquantino. And, you know, I was happy to see it, of course. But, I don't know. His hardest hit ball was like 102 miles per hour. Ah, come on. Don't rain on the parade. The, (laughs) (laughs) The expected batting average on the double was 140. You know, I don't know. Um, I I will say, I I have I have not. Um, my faith in Vinny Pasquantino hasn't diminished based on what's happened so far. Yes, I think there is. I, I think it's reasonable to be concerned that there's lingering effects from the shoulder surgery that it's, it's sapping him of some power. I think that's a reasonable concern, but that's also kind of why he was going as late as he was, right? It was, it was baked into the price. And I don't think anything we've seen from him so far is conclusive one way or another. I don't think the slow start was conclusive that, Oh yeah, his shoulders still mess up or this good game is conclusive that never mind, He's fine. He his hardest hit ball so far this year is harder than any he hit last year. And remember, his first 38 games last year were very, very good. So I, I think that's the most encouraging sign. The plate discipline has been excellent, like it always is for Vinny Pasquantino. And so those are the main reasons why I think you got to keep the faith. Uh games like this happen for every player where they put up a good stat line, even though the underlying numbers aren't good. And and I, I think we should still enjoy it when it happens. But I I don't think this is I like I don't think this game should necessarily be what relieves your concerns for Pasquantino. So I don't know if I have a crystal clear point in there. I I, I think we should be patient when, with Vinny. Hopefully this will help to um promote patience. But you know, they're, 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 we, we still got to figure out. We still got to figure out exactly what we're working with here. He he had a he has a sixty one weighted runs created plus after this game. That's a scale to one hundred is average. Uh, he raised it sixty three points with this performance. He had a negative two weighted runs created plus before the game is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I don't quite know how that scale works, but that is uh, just a sign of how bad he's been so far this season and how much this one game did for his line. I, I mostly agree with Scott. I might be like slightly more concerned about Pasquantino just because he really hasn't been hitting the ball well so far this season. It's a lot of soft contact. It's not a lot of quality contact in the air especially but i'm sitting him if anything if i'm concerned i'm not dropping him no 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 one should be dropping vinnie pasquantino chris let's have you hop out and hop back in because there was 
a little bit of lag there when, when you were talking. I love how many times we bring up a player on the Worryometer and then the very next day they have a huge game. And it's just, you talk about enough players that are struggling and obviously like they're just bound to have yeah. a good game the next day. But I always well, love when that happens. It's just, it's it's so funny the way that works. Yeah, I mean, they're usually they do. And I, I understand people out there will say do isn't a thing. But, you know, it depends what you mean by it. Like if 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 a play, if you believe a player is underperforming, then eventually regression will come. And that's basically what I mean and what I've always meant when I said a player is due. Not that there's some kind of, uh, you know, cosmic quality to it or anything like that. Chris, you are back. How do you sound? How do you look? I don't know. Uh, you, you have to tell me. Seems all right for the first five seconds that you're here so let's talk about your player of the night my player of the night is a guy who frankly was disrespected on this show and in the fantasy community at large and that is Yusei Kikuchi who had a terrific start today against I, I, th Seattle I thought you were going to go with a different left-handed pitcher but that's fine uh no because that's what I, I thought you were building up to I have I mean because really, you guys didn't disrespect that guy. You disrespected me, and that's different. <laughs> um, no, Yusei Kikuchi is, I just think, really good. He's only like 70% rostered in CBS Fantasy Leagues, which means he's probably only like 40% rostered in Yahoo um, and ESPN because their roster rates are even lower. And I think that is ridiculous. I think y Yusei Kikuchi is someone who probably deserves to be rostered in pretty much all formats. He is... I just think a really solid pitcher. Nine strikeouts and in six innings today. Over the past, let me see, 365 days. Yusei Kikuchi has made 33 starts. He has a 3.57 ERA with 193 strikeouts over his past 33 starts. And that's not with that's with still a pretty awful April and I think most of May last year. He really figured things out after a couple of months and has been rolling since then. He's got a bunch of swing and miss pitches. He's one of those guys who I have faith in figuring it out when things are going poorly because he's tinkered his way to success already. And uh, yeah, I, I think you say Kikuchi's really, really good. Uh, yeah, I, I was looking into the numbers today and, and obviously what he did last year and the way that he finished out the season. And I was surprised that he was only 71% roster mm -hmm. just uh, based on how well he pitched last season. And then, you know, he's, He's had three pretty good starts here to start this year as well. He had the nine strikeouts against the Mariners here on Wednesday, 13 swinging strikes on 89 pitches, and he's throwing his curveball more this year, and it looks like that's a pretty good decision. So at 71% well, rostered, I would argue that number needs to be higher. So what stood out to me for Kikuchi in this start is of his 13 whiffs, six came on the slider, which mm -hmm. is usually – Long been considered his best pitch, six on the slider. He entered with zero whiffs yeah. on the slider this year. So I, I don't know what was going on with that pitch, but uh, if he's rediscovered it, then that's all the more reason for optimism with Yusei Kikuchi. Let's talk about who he was opposing in that matchup real quick, just while we're on that game. Logan Gilbert, great start against the Blue Jays, seven and two-thirds innings, one run, eight strikeouts, 15 swinging strikes on 89 pitches. And he led with his slider in this start. It was his most used pitch at 39%, and it was great. Had nine of his 15 swinging strikes, a 56% whiff rate. Continues to work in this new cutter this season as well. And through three starts, it's a 266 ERA and a .84 whip. Anything to add on what we've seen from Logan Gilbert so far this season? Uh, not really. I mean, in this start, he threw a slider a ton, like 40% of the time. And usually it's, I think usually it's more like 25. That's just me saying things because I was looking to fill time. I don't know that it necessarily means anything. Logan Gilbert's look good. And thankfully we have a pitcher who's living up to expectations so far. Well, that brings us to the, uh, what I would consider the Olive Garden breadstick of the night. Oh, we missed it. And yeah, you guys missed we left it. it for you. We were I being left polite. it. Well, I get, I left it there for you guys. And you just when you hear your family, it you was know. the other guy. It's the other guy, Cody 
Bradford makes it back-to-back quality starts. This one against the Oakland A's, obviously a great matchup. And he dominated six and two thirds innings, one unearned run, seven strikeouts to one walk. He had 17 swinging strikes on 94 pitches. This is coming off another great start that he just had against the Astros the last time he was out. And yes, we did joke with Chris before the season because he kept drafting Cody Bradford as a very late round spark in head to head points leagues. But so far, he is off to a great start. He's a soft tossing lefty, only 90 miles per hour with the fastball, but he's got a really good changeup. He has great control. It also looks like he's throwing a new curveball this season. It's like a slower mid 70s mm-hmm. uh, curveball, and, and it's not getting many whiffs, but the results on balls in play have been pretty good on that pitch. Cody Bradford is 69% rostered. If he remains in the rotation, it looks like he might line up for two starts next week at the Tigers and I at would. the Atlanta Braves. I would imagine he's going to stay in the rotation at this point over yeah. Andrew Heaney, I would guess, would would get the bump over him. That was the next question. Yeah, no, I think so. Look, I, I remain a Cody Bradford skeptic. Same. He, okay, good. Uh, he is an extreme fly ball pitcher. And like it's over 60% this year, the fly ball rate, very, very high. And extreme fly ball pitchers are generally good at limiting hits, which can lead to some good starts like like we've seen so far. And he's got really good control. I, I think borderline elite control. And so some some other examples of extreme fly ball pitchers who are good, Bailey Ober, uh, you know, Tyler Wells, I think is pretty good. Christian Javier, to a certain extent, is a fly ball pitcher. But those guys are pretty good at missing bats. And I don't think Cody Bradford is. I say that knowing he struck out seven and six and two-thirds innings. He got 17 whiffs today against the Athletics. His yeah. first two starts certainly weren't like that. His his uh, last year wasn't like that. Also, last year, he allowed some of the hardest contact of any pitcher. Small sample. He was a rookie. I understand all of that. But I I don't think he... I, I think he's the sort of extreme fly ball pitcher whose extreme fly ball tendencies are going to be more of a hindrance than a help in the long run. So I'm okay with him as a streamer. Mm -hmm. The fact one of those two starts next week is against the Braves makes me a little squeamish. I might, I might leave him for the points leagues, especially since he's RP eligible, but I don't think Cody Bradford is somebody you should be uh, dropping anybody you care about for. The one thing I will note is in this start, I think the one thing that was interesting is the slider. He threw it nine times. He'd only thrown it four times in the previous two starts coming in. He had also thrown three cutters, which he didn't throw today. I wonder if that's just those pitches are very similar in velocity. They might just be the same pitch, and it's just a classification thing. But he did get four whiffs on five swings with the slider today. He hadn't had a whiff on any of the only through four before this coming in. So... That's kind of interesting, but I, I don't. It's one start. It's against the A's. I don't know how much you actually take from that. So, yeah, I like it is possible that he is doing like a Kyle Hendricks impersonation and can command and uh, quality of contact his way to being a pretty useful fantasy option. But the thing about Kyle Hendricks is the first three starts of this season and most of the 2022 season, notwithstanding we have a long track record of Kyle Hendricks being really good at suppressing quality of contact in a way that makes him a true outlier. And that is a stat that takes a really, really long time to stabilize. And so you need a lot more than three good starts to say, Hey, Cody Bradford can do this moving forward. Maybe he can like, that's the blueprint, but I, I think skepticism is the right call. I think he's worth streaming against the Tigers. And I think if we don't mention Cody Bradford again after that start against Atlanta, I would not be surprised. Even with all my hemming and hawing about Cody Bradford, I would take Yusei Kikuchi over him. So, uh, Absolutely. Sure. Yeah, sure. I was being a, a bit facetious there. How about from the other names that we've talked about this week as waiver wire pitchers, like Martin Perez, Tyler Anderson, would you take Cody Bradford over those two? I mean, other than a streaming scenario, I, I don't I don't think I do. And I'm not a huge believer in Tyler Anderson and Martin Perez, but you know, heading into last year, they were part of the Mount Rushmore, right? So they, they were coming off a great year in 2022. And that they're showing some of those signs again, at least 
at least gives me like a smidgen of hope that maybe they'll remain useful. All right. Or, or more than useful. Like I, I think Cody Bradford could be useful, but those guys could maybe be more than useful. Wanted to give an honorable mention to the Bash Bros. Literally, on National Siblings Day, Josh and Bo Naylor homered in the same inning, uh, and it was Josh Naylor's third home run of the season. He had four hard hits in that game. He is off to a really nice start. Bo Naylor, it was his second home run. He added three RBI. Struggling a little bit here early on, a 194 batting average, 40% strikeout rate. You don't love to see that, but he is hitting the ball really hard. Would like to see more consistent playing time, but uh, hopefully this is a sign of things to come for Bo Naylor. Let's take our first break. When we return, we'll get into some news and notes, and we will do that right after this. Every spring, we marvel at its majesty, a tradition unlike any other, the Masters. This weekend on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Welcome back in. Let's talk some news and notes. Kodai Senga was transferred to the 60-day IL. It doesn't sound like he's had a setback or anything. Manager Carlos Mendoza said Senga has yet to advance to mound work, so perhaps they're just being cautious. The earliest we'll see Kodai Senga is now late May. JT Rulimuto was back in the lineup Wednesday after taking a uh, breaking ball that bounced off the plate and hit him in the neck while he was playing catcher on Tuesday night. So it was nice to see that a, he was all right. B back in the lineup. Brandon Lau will undergo an MRI on his right oblique Rays manager. Kevin cash said it's quote fair to say he will miss some time. And somebody on Twitter pointed out that all three of the lows and Lau's, uh -huh. Brandon Nathaniel and Josh, oh. they are all on the IL with oblique injuries. My Same gosh. Injuries. So uh, more like low bleak. Am I right, Scott? Mm, thanks for the <laughs> lowdown on that. Ah, I there is a tangential story here with 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 Brandon Lau presumably being out for a while. Yes, you know where I'm going, right? I hope I do. <laughs> Junior Camonero is yes. What well, just today he took batting practice. He took grounders. It, he's probably going to be back in the AAA lineup soon. And the Rays have lost a lot of infielders. Now, I, I don't think Camonero is going to go from, from taking grounders and batting practice one day to batting cleanup at Tropicana Field the next. There will be some time in between where he's getting at-bats at AAA, I would imagine. But if this is a multi-week absence for Lau, which it sounds like it could be, then... You you kind of think you, you have to think he's the next man up, right? I mean, Jonathan Aranda's still dealing with his broken finger. He's not ready to go yet. The one hesitation is Curtis Mead wasn't getting regular bats for the Rays, and when he's been in the lineup, it's mostly been at second base. So maybe they 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 they'll more likely use this Lau injury as an excuse to integrate Mead better. Uh, that that would be my my biggest hesitation, but. Bottom line is, if Camonero is out there in your league, like he's the top prospect to stash now that Jackson Holiday is up, and I think it's even more urgent to do that. Lars Newbar could be activated from the IL on Friday. He started the season on the IL due to non-displaced fractures in his left rib cage. Anthony Volpe was moved up to the leadoff spot with Glaber Torres sliding down to sixth in the lineup, and uh, Volpe in that game went one for three with two walks and a run scored. So if he continues to do anything close to what he's done so far and just takes over that leadoff spot, it can be primo for fantasy. I mean, in front of Juan Soto and Aaron Judge. Oh, yes. I mean, it kind of blew my mind how much DJ LeMahieu was being overlooked in drafts before, obviously, he suffered his injury, given that he was penciled into that leadoff spot. But... I don't know that he's getting it back now. I mean, Volpe might just stay there. Or maybe Volpe's a big phony and not hitting the ball hard enough to continue. But I, I lean toward the former. I think he's I think he's figured it out with the flatter swing and he's getting on base a ton. And it's uh I I, I could not justify moving Jackson Holiday ahead of him when I was updating my shortstop rankings yesterday. Samesies. Brandon Marsh was moved up to sixth in the Phillies lineup with Bryson Stott sliding down to eighth. Danny Jansen began a rehab assignment at AAA on Wednesday. Yoan Moncada was placed on the IL and will miss three to six months with a left adductor strain. 
Oscar Colas was recalled uh, by the White Sox. Robert Stevenson will begin a rehab assignment at AAA on Sunday. Brewers outfielder Garrett Mitchell should return around June 1st. He's on the IL with a fractured left index finger. Brewers catcher prospect Jefferson Caro uh, will undergo season-ending surgery to repair a torn labrum in his right shoulder. And Shohei Otani's former interpreter Ipe Mizuhara is reportedly in negotiation negotiations to plead guilty to multiple federal charges. We'll see where uh, everything goes from here in that Otani situation. Waiver wire hitters. Let's talk about some of these names who had some big games on Wednesday. Should Edward Julian's roster rate be higher? I'm not so sure. Three for four with a double dong. One off Bobby Miller. One off a lefty reliever in Alex Vesia. Uh, so Both to the opposite field, which is <laughs> what... Edward, Edward Julian does. Special. Yeah, I, I saw him in the Arizona Fall League home run derby two years ago, and he was legit trying to hit everything to the opposite mm. field. It's like, why That's are you? What he does? Derby? It's, it's a very strange player. Very, very strange indeed. Uh, but it's a 188 batting average early on, 12 strikeouts, 34 percent strikeout rate. The ground ball rate is high. This obviously was a great game, and if he per continues to get some opportunities against lefties and performs, then I think. Our faith can grow in him as a fantasy player. But as of now, even with this big game, Chris, I 61% rostered is probably just right. Maybe even a little bit high for Julian. Yeah, I think that might be a little high because the... I think the Twins have only faced two left-handed starters so far because he's played... That's right. Yeah, he's appeared in every game. He started all but two, and the two that he didn't were against lefties. So... I think he is probably going to play less moving forward than he has been. And I'm just not sure how fantasy friendly his profile is because of that. Cause obviously I think in an ideal world, he could be a really good head to head points league player because of his plate discipline. But if he's not going to play every day, that is a big hit. And I think he's probably going to be a pretty low batting average guy. He's not going to steal bases. He'll hit for good, but not great power. And so it's like when you add it all up, 61% actually kind of sounds a little high to me. Yeah, that's where I was going to. And you want to say he's a player that could be better in real life, but even defensively, he's not good either. He's just such a unique player mm -hmm. in, in Edward Julian. Mm -hmm. He's still young enough where he could turn into something. So I don't want to yeah. downplay that possibility, but uh, we'll see where he goes from here. Two young uh, corner infielders, Michael Bush and Jordan Westberg, both had big games here on Wednesday. Bush went one for two with two walks and his second home run. He moved up to fifth in the Cubs lineup in this game, and he's hitting the ball hard early on, 24% line drive rate. The walks have been there as well. Jordan Westberg went two for three with a double, and his second home run, he added three RBI. Three hard hits in this game. The home run, 111.2 exit velocity, 432 feet. And entering this game, it was a 94 mile per hour average exit velocity. So, Scott, I know you like Michael Bush. I know there is mm -hmm. some skepticism about Westberg and, and the park that he plays in, but yeah, in the ball hard early on. And I'm just really intrigued by both of these guys, and I want to see what they can do. Yeah, I, I mean my my concerns for Westberg remain. Any any right handed power hitter in the Orioles lineup is. I mean, if you can't hit the ball much harder than Ryan Mountcastle does, and yet even he's struggled to uh, deliver the sort of power numbers we're looking for since the Orioles made that change in left field at Camden Yards. Though he's off to a good start this year, Mountcastle is. But Bush, I am really excited about how things are going for Bush. I expected him to get off to a slow start. And he kind of did, I guess, but you know, it's only April 11th and suddenly his numbers look pretty good as somebody who's followed Michael Bush's minor league numbers very closely for three years. Uh, one thing I noticed is that he'd be crushing one level and you'd be like, Oh my goodness, this is, this is Michael Bush's coming out party. And then they'd move him up and he, he, his numbers would get dragged down right away. But then eventually he'd figure out that level and he'd be putting up ridiculous numbers there. He just, it, it just seems like it takes him a while to settle in at a new level at a higher level of competition. And I'm, I'm hopeful that's what we're seeing now. And of course he's, he's gotten, he got some exposure in the majors last year. So maybe that was the, 
the rough patch I'm referring to. But uh, yeah, he's walking a ton and uh, he's, he's beginning to connect for home runs. So stock up for Michael Bush, I would say. I, I will point out with Westberg, his hard hit rate right now is 64%. Uh, his average exit velocity, <laughs> it's not updated yet. It's got to be, it might be over 95 miles per hour after today. He had three but, more hard hit balls today. But you um, know, like he's, he's not going to yeah. have better than, than Ryan Mountcastle had last year. As far as that goes, probably not. Like that's the thing is what yeah. you're seeing in the early going of his career. It's a very small sample size, but 318 expected Woba. 303 actual woba. That's what happens to right-handed hitters at Camden Yards now. So I, I, I think you're probably right in in Bush being a, a little higher. But you know Westberg is talented enough to potentially overcome that. It's just there's probably a ceiling on how good he can be for fantasy. All right, let's move on to two other players. Should these two be rostered in all roto-sized leagues? We're talking leagues with middle, corner, infield, and five outfielders as well. Uh, Jose Caballero had a big game, one for three with his first home run, and he's off to a nice start. He has five stolen bases. He's batting 351. And Nelson Velasquez continues his nice start with the Royals, two for four with two RBI. He's batting 343 with a 995 OPS. Uh, does have a 34% strikeout rate early on. Uh, but Scott, uh, do you think those two names should be rostered in all roto size leagues, Caballero and Nelson Velasquez? Basically, yes. It would have to be a five outfielder roto league specifically for Nelson Velasquez, as roto leagues usually are. I think I, I don't see a scenario where Velasquez becomes relevant in points leagues because of the strikeouts. And I think his upside is probably limited to like a outfield four outfielder four for roto but uh, i i do think he's going to keep getting opportunities and the home run total sh should be pretty good i'm even more intrigued by jose caballero and you know maybe this is confirmation bias because the rays went out and acquired him to be their starting shortstop and they're the rays um his home run today i believe was the hardest hit ball of his career and I know they were uh, encouraging him. There was a story this spring that they were encouraging him to swing for more impact, to, to, to try and elevate the ball in the air more, basically hoping to do the Isak Paredes thing with Caballero. It doesn't seem like the exit velocities would support it, but the exit velocity on this home run was very good, best of his career. And he's running a ton, which we were hopeful he'd do, but we're actually seeing it play out. He already has five stolen bases. I don't know how many walks he has, but he was a good on base guy. Zero. With, zero so far. He was a good on base guy with the Mariners. So I would expect that to improve. I am tempted to kind of start Nico Horner's off to, and knowing that, you know, Nico Horner has his limits anyway. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling in steals in one of my roto leagues where Caballero is just sitting on my bench. And I'm, I'm tempted next week to, swap out Horner for Caballero, not as a permanent measure, but just until we see some signs of life from Horner here. Cause I'm not even sure. Like I'm, I have some concerns about Horner being down in the lineup and not being in that table set a role anymore and just not running anymore because of it. He, he doesn't have a stolen base yet. He's also hitting like 140. and I know Nico Horner's going to hit. So I'm trying to be patient there with this. It's kind of just a theory right now. If he's batting seventh, is he going to want to run that much? Uh, but but I do have some concerns with Horner as far as that goes. And Caballero is delivering the steals. Would you rather have Caballero or Bryce Terang? Caballero. I was just updating the rankings here on uh, Wednesday, and I was, I was wrestling with that decision myself. Uh, yeah, I have Terang one spot higher than Caballero, but I think it's... I think it's pretty damn close between those two. I, yeah. I, yeah. I I would make an argument for uh, either one in category leagues just to make sure that they are rostered if you do need steals on your team. I, I am giving cop like most of the difference there isn't data. It's just uh, giving Caballero extra credit because it's the Rays who wanted him. Mm -hmm. 
Let's talk about a few deep league ads. And first up, outfielders. I thought there was a lot of pretty interesting performances here for, for some deep league names. Joe Adele, two for four with a sock and a shoe. His first home run of the season, his third stolen base. He only has three starts this season. Got this one against a righty. So I thought that was pretty encouraging. Really small sample size, but the strikeout rate is down early on in the season. Gavin Sheets had a monster game, three for five with a sock and a shoe. His second home run, his first stolen base. He had three hard hits in this game and looks like he's in line for lots of playing time uh, due to the injuries to Luis Robert and Eloy Jimenez. Jerickson Profar went three for three with his second home run, added three RBI. Uh, he's got 10 RBI total so far on the season. He's batting 333. Entered this game hitting the ball really hard. I don't know how sustainable that is. Uh, and Blake Perkins, who plays outfield for the Brewers, went one for two with a walk, a sock, and a shoe has started three of the past four games. Chris, any interest in deeper leagues here? Blake Perkins, Jerkson Profar, Gavin Sheets, and Joe Adele. Um, I want to be interested in Joe Adele because I still believe that he can be a useful player. And early on, there are some really positive signs. He's still hitting the ball hard, but his zone contact rate in the early going is 80%. His chase rate is down to the lowest it's ever been at the major league level. His whiff rate is half of what it was last year. He's also seen like 65 pitches. So I don't think we can actually draw any conclusions from anything that we're seeing so far with Joe Adele. So I don't think outside of mono leagues, I, I would have any interest in any of these guys. Scott, any different opinion on those names? Uh, no, not really. I mean, I'm Jerks and Profar, he's hitting the ball much harder than usual on average, but just on average. And I think, you know, barrel rate's the same, max exit velocity. It's not like he set a new high for that. I, I think he's going to turn back into Jerks and Profar soon. I'm a I'm a little curious about Gavin Sheets because Good minor league numbers, uh, he, good rookie production in 2021 in a part-time role, but and then just did nothing in 2022, 2023. The strikeout rate has always been good for Gavin Sheets. Just low quality of contact. Well, he hit three balls 105 miles per hour today, I think it was. And, you know, obviously he's been doing well since the White Sox put him in the lineup. I don't think there's anything to it, but... I think he's enough of a mystery box, Gavin Sheets, that I'd, I'd at least be keeping an eye on him. Deep league, non-outfielders. Blaze Alexander continue to mention, I mean, he just keeps hitting so far. Two for two with a walk and his second home run. He's 12% rostered. The D-backs have seven games next week, three lefties on the schedule. So if you're looking for a middle infielder, I, I think he'd be a fine addition. And Ivan Herrera who is a catcher on the Cardinals, went one for four with his third home run. He crushed this one, 112.4 exit velocity, 432 feet, and he's been getting some playing time with Wilson Contreras banged up. Contreras has returned the past two days, and they have him playing DH with Ivan Herrera at catcher. Any interest in Herrera? I mean, we're talking like 15-team, two catcher leagues, but... I, I think even 12... I think even 12 team Like, it requires the Cardinals best lineup on most days to feature both Herrera and C Contreras. That might be the case though, with, with what he show, I believe the, the home run Herrera hit was the hardest hit ball of his MLB career. He's got like an eight 30 ish OPS in his minor league career. I think if you don't like what you're getting from your number two catcher, I think it's fine to roll the dice on Ivan Herrera and just see if, the Cardinals keep rolling the two catcher lineups out there and he can stay hot because I think within the realm of two catcher type players, he's like, uh, Oh my God. Alejandro Kirk is who, the name that I was trying to think of who is off to a really bad start. His quality of contact is like the worst that it's ever been. Um, 363 OPS. I believe his average exit velocity is down to 86 miles per hour. Like, I kind of think I'd be okay dropping Alejandro Kirk and just seeing if Ivan Herrera can do something in a two catcher league just because you're not getting anything from Kirk and he kind of needed to get off to a hot start to 
overcome the concerns we had coming out of last year. Yeah, I mean, I, if 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 it doesn't work out with Herrera, though, in a two catcher league, probably you've lost Alejandro Kirk at that. Point. I don't know, man. Is anybody going to go out and add? 363 OPS Alejandro Kirk right now? You go you go really deep into the catcher rankings in a two yeah. catcher league and, and somebody's starting somebody's starting but like m- multiple somebody's are starting a truly awful catcher. Sure. And and I would rather take the flyer on Che Langoliers coming off the three homer game. Um he's probably already rostered than, than Yvonne Herrera. Right? He he was like twenty something percent, I think, yesterday. Um yeah, how many two catcher leagues are there on CBS? I don't know, but there there are Probably there are enough work. boring two catcher types that I'm okay playing a hot hand okay. if you don't have one of the you know top seventeen or eighteen that we really liked. All right, let's hit our final break, and when we return, we'll run through some waiver wire pitchers. Then we have some rankings, risers, and fallers. We'll do that right after this. Two big boys get ready to play. Big being the operative word here. Welcome back in. Let's talk some waiver wire pitchers. We already mentioned Cody Bradford and Yusei Kikuchi up top. There were two other names that stood out to me. Seth Lugo is now three for three in quality starts. This one came against the Houston Astros. Six innings, two runs, two strikeouts, only five swinging strikes on 90 pitches. Has really just pitched to contact so far this year. He's getting ground balls. It's worked. He's 66% rostered and looks like he might be in line for two starts next week. The other name is Lance Lynn, who was solid against the Phillies. Five innings, one hit, two unearned runs, four walks, six strikeouts in that one. Velocity was down. It was also 57 degrees and raining in St. Louis. Uh, Scott, how would you rank Kikuchi, Bradford, Seth Lugo, and Lance Lynn? Kikuchi, uh, Lugo, Bradford, Lynn. Kikuchi's right. a distant first. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. In deeper leagues, Ryan Weathers was okay at the Yankees. Five shutout innings, three hits, three walks, only one strikeout in this one. He is 12% rostered and might be in line with for two starts next week as well, the Giants and at the Cubs. Wade Miley was solid in his season debut at the Reds. Four innings, one hit, one run, two walks to zero strikeouts. He does not get any strikeouts, but... Over the past three years, Wade Miley has thrown 320 innings of a 326 ERA. So do with that what you will. Chris, any interest in deeper leagues in uh, Wade Miley or Ryan Weathers? I mean, Wade Miley tends to get the job done a lot more often than he doesn't. So I, I think like I get why he's not widely rostered. I get why he was not widely drafted coming into the season, but once the season starts and attrition starts to take over, I mean, this guy's been really useful for fantasy way more often than not. He's had one season with an ERA over four since 2017, I believe. Uh, and that was 2020, the shortened season. So I, I think Wade Miley's a perfectly viable streamer, much more so than Ryan Weathers, who I just, I don't think there's much of anything interesting going on there, despite, a little bit of hype coming into the season. And based on the way the Marlins starters have performed, my guess is Max Meyer's probably going to stick around. And maybe once Braxton Garrett and Edward Cabrera are ready to rejoin the rotation, which could be, should be next week. Those guys will be back. And my guess is puck and weathers will probably be out. I I would guess so as well. I don't know what the like option situation is with any of those guys or their relievers. But at this point, I would think puck and weathers get the boot and Cabrera was it today had a really, really good rehab start and what might've been his final rehab start. I think it was like nine strikeouts to one walk and it's his production before that in his rehab assignment had been really bad. And so it's hard to buy in too much, but I don't know, man, Edward Cabrera still has a lot of upside famous last words for Marlins pitcher. I know, but uh, yeah, I would think Ryan Weathers and AJ Puck are probably out of the rotation. I, I do. When those guys are healthy. And and it's probably not important enough to bring up, but I'm going to bring it up anyway. I do wonder if while they have Puck stretched out, given, you know, all the, every team has need 
continual mm-hmm. need for more starting pitchers. I, I do wonder if they'd rather option a guy than send Puck to the bullpen and lose the option of starting Puck in the future. Maybe he's been so bad. Yeah, he's been bad, but 14, it's, it's 14 just, walks. Do they actually do they think he's bad or do they think he can adjust something? And obviously the Marlins aren't contending this year. They're already talking about selling off. So I think it's just it's I don't think they're necessarily most interested in fielding the most competitive rotation possible. I think the the more reasonable question is how many innings can they reasonably expect from Max Meyer anyway? Yeah. And so do they just let him throw 90 innings in the first half and then pull the plug or do they try to manage it throughout the season? That's a different question, but I, at this point, I would guess Meyer and Rogers stay in the rotation. Yeah, that Edward Cabrera start, by the way, on Wednesday uh, at Triple A, five and two thirds innings, one unearned run, nine strikeouts to one walk. So, uh, pretty awesome start there. Let's talk some rankings, risers and fallers. And for anybody who's wondering where do I find those rankings, CBSSports.com/slash/fantasy/slash/baseball. Slash rankings. You can also find them on the CBS Fantasy app. And Scott, why don't you start us off with uh, some of the risers? Well, I'm going to make a change here because I see Chris also picked one I did, and I'd rather throw more names at people. Uh, And I also want to point out that this year I'm introducing a new column for days when I do my full rankings audit. Usually once a week I go name by name, and it takes several hours. And now I've got a column called Rankings Movers where I explain a lot of the changes I made. Not all of them, of course, but a lot of them. And uh, it's up on the site now. It's a little hidden, but the feedback I've gotten on from sharing it on Twitter has been good. So I think it's, I think it's going to be a good one. Uh, so some of the names that I talked about in there, some of the risers I talked about there, Reed Detmers was the biggest riser among starting pitchers. He jumped about 30 spots for me. To, to 42nd and I mean what we've seen from him so far we talked about the slider a lot but really the fastball that it's gotten double digit whiffs in each of his first two starts that's he's showing ace characteristics there and so I've moved him ahead of some of the other early hype pitchers like Gavin Stone for instance uh, I think Detmers deserves to be in that group uh Tyler O'Neill's another riser Hit his sixth home run, what was it, Monday? And, you know, we've seen him have a 34 homer, 15 steal season in the past, I believe it was. And he's he's healthier than he's been in a long time. And he's at Fenway Park for the first time. And he's got these giant muscles where the veins are popping out. And just like, He's, I think he's walked more than he struck out too. So he's doing everything right. And outfield is obviously a thin position. So it's not that hard to get Tyler O'Neill into the top 30 like I've done. And then the third one I'm going to mention here is Spencer Steer, who hasn't moved up that much because there's only so much you can move up at the infield spots, particularly if you're already a mid-round player. But I moved him ahead of Vinny P actually in points leagues. He was already ahead of Vinny P, Vinny Pasquantino in, in, in Roto Leagues. Um but I also moved Spencer Steer at third base. I moved him ahead of Nolan Arenado because obviously the the um, playing time concerns are out the window now. That was that was my biggest hang up with Steer for most of draft prep season before the Reds got devastated by injury. Uh, he's you know he obviously hasn't turned into uh, a pumpkin here. He's off to a great start, hitting for power. And I don't think like at this stage of Nolan Arenado's career in his mid thirties, you know, he's, he's never had great exit velocities relies on pulling the ball in the air a ton to, to deliver power. He had 26 home runs last year. Mm -hmm. They might be near equals in terms of my expected power production for them, Arenado and steer. But I think steer has a better case for stolen bases. Certainly maybe a better case for batting average. Plus he's Mm -hmm. triple eligible. So I'm I'm taking it. It's reasonable. Um, yeah, I, I agree with the, uh, O'Neill and Detmers. I moved steer up a little bit as well. I, I didn't get him up ahead of Arenado, but I, I think I got Detmers up to around 47. He definitely inside my top 50 starting pitchers. And I, you know, I wanted to update my rankings here on Wednesday without looking at either of your rankings. Cause I didn't want to be influenced by them. And it was so funny. We wound up in, in such similar spots on all these players. And it's mm-hmm. just, it's just funny how that works out. I moved up Tyler O'Neill to outfielder 32, and Scott, you moved them up to your 30th ranked outfielder. So I just 33 for me. 
I found it funny how we all kind of wound it, up at that same spot. It, it, it is funny how often that, like we moved them in the same vicinity, three or four spots without any consultation on it. It, it I, happens surprisingly often. I'm a little lower on Detmers. Um, I've got a couple of other early season breakouts ahead of him, but I agree with everything you said. He's looked really, really good. The, the fastball is playing up. He, he seems to have improved the shape of the fastball and the slider looks a lot better as well. That was weirdly ineffective for him, but he's taken a couple miles per hour off of it and seems to have made it uh, a more effective pitch. But there are three other early season breakout pitchers I have ahead of him. And who are they, Chris? Jared Jones. I've moved him to SP36. Um, I'm really, really excited about him. And, and part of it is just that, like, if nobody's going to stay healthy, why am I going to worry about the young guy who throws 99 miles an hour, right? Like, And, and right. the thing about Jared Jones is he's kind of a two-pitch pitcher. He's kind of not because he throws his fastball and slider about 85% of the time, which means that he throws a... Uh, is it a curveball and a cutter as well? Uh, I think he rounds out his arsenal with but the fastball and slider are what you need to know about the fastball. According to the stuff plus metrics on fan graphs is the best fastball in baseball in the early going. I think his slider is like seventh mm -hmm. by that metric. And the thing about the slider that I think is really interesting is it's kind of two pitches. He's got a harder version that he throws like 89 to 92 miles per hour that acts more like a cutter and then he's got a softer version that's in like the 85 to 88 mile per hour range that's more of a traditional slider has a little more two plane break and so he's a two pitch pitcher which you can get away with justin Steele's a two pitch pitcher spencer strider's a two pitch pitcher those pitches have to be really good and i think jared jones are yeah and you, and and you said it's the most effective fastball according to stuff plus yeah when I've watched him pitch, I, I've gotten. I, I dudes I, look so uncomfortable against him. It reminds it reminds me of Spencer Strider. Yeah, that, ah. I think that's the most obvious comp. Like it's yeah, it's too high praise. Yeah, but that's what it looks yeah. like right now. I was like, is Scott going to do it? Is he going to say it? Is he... <laughs> and he did it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, yeah. Kevin Gosman threw his top two pitches eighty five percent of the time as well last season. Like. You can get away with that. You just have to have really, really good pitches. And then Jared Jones seems to. He's also thrown like 140 plus innings at the minor league level. So if he stays healthy, I don't think innings are going to be a concern. Um, I kind of feel like SP36 might not be aggressive yeah. enough, but I'm just. I, I moved him to 40. That was the yeah. other one I was going to talk about. Um, so I, yeah, I'm. I kind of feel like it's both too high and too low. Mm -hmm. the, the the point you brought up, but well, if everybody's vulnerable to in, it's funny we 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 obsess over injury risk and and durability so mm -hmm. much in the preseason, and then the season starts, and it's like oh, and anybody could get hurt anyway. So yeah. let's just let's just go with the guy who we think is going to be most dominant right now. And I I think if I think from that context, maybe forty where I have him or thirty six where you have him is too low for Jared yeah. Jones but it's a little bit of, okay, but he is a rookie. How many innings yeah. is he realistically going to throw? Bad team context. Um, whoa, maybe. whoa, the Pirates <laughs> are also a great start. Here's Mediocre here's team context, probably. Um, the yeah. other ones that I've got, I've got Bryce Miller at SP48, Mackenzie Gore at SP49, so I've got them just ahead of Reed Detmers, and I think you could group those three guys in whatever order you want, but I'm really impressed with, Bryce Miller's splitter in particular, his slider and sweeper still look like non-factors for him, but the splitter looks really good. He's throwing a sinker, which I think can help him uh, mitigate what he might lose against right-handed hitters without the slider and sweeper being good. And then Mackenzie Gore, his fastball velocity is up two miles per hour. The fastball shape looks really good. It's been a dominant pitch for him. And he's throwing his changeup a ton more. He's throwing his slider more like a cutter. So there's a lot of things changing with Mackenzie Gore. But I think all in all, the, the numbers haven't been great. But I think the process has been really, really impressive for a guy who was the top pitching prospect in baseball at one point. It could be another... Um, Oh my, why is my brain doing this? The White Sox pitch, Lucas Giolito. Not even 40. Lucas Giolito, <laughs> who uh, I know, I, I, trust me, I worry about my memory <laughs> as I age. 
Uh, Lucas Giolito uh, could be another one where top prospect took some time to figure it out and needed to make some changes, but I, I think Mackenzie Gore could be figuring it out, and that's very exciting. I also moved Bryce Terang up to my 17th second baseman in Roto. Um, and Christopher Morrell to outfield 39, which might be too low. And I imagine you guys probably had him that high already. Mm-hmm. And so I might just be catching up. I, I, I want to praise you, Chris, because you wrote an article earlier this week about those three pitchers. You just talked about Jared Jones, Bryce Miller and McKenzie Gore. And the analysis was so good. I mean, you gave the, 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 the bullet points just now, but I encourage people to go read it because it, it, it won me over. I mean, I was already pretty high on Jared Jones, but it, it won me over and was a big reason I moved Bryce Miller and Mackenzie Gore uh, as far up my rankings as I did. Mackenzie Gore, second in Stuff Plus with the fastball. Mm. So that's that's another early riser there. I moved him up to SP64, but it might not be high enough based on what you're telling me here, Chris. That is Mackenzie Gore that we're talking about. I do think it's a little bit tougher to be more aggressive on fallers this early in the season. Yes. But, Scott, who were some names that dropped down your rankings a little bit? All right. I'll try to be a little quicker with this if I can find where we are in the rundown. Okay, fallers. Uh, I moved Jared uh, Jamer Candelario down a little bit because I think I had a very optimistic ranking in the first place, and I'm not saying he can't be. He can't live up to the sleeper hype in, in Cincinnati and hit a career high in home runs, but I moved him specifically behind Isak Paredes, who's already done it and is – off to a much better start. And I, I just didn't see the justification for keeping Jamer Candelario ahead of him. Uh, I also moved Bryson Stott behind Andres Jimenez. And I kind of wonder why I didn't have it that way in the first place, because I feel like Jimenez could end up with twice as many steals as Stott. He only has one so far. So it's not like that's the reason. It's not like, oh, he's stealing a bunch of bases. That was the impetus for it. More of the impetus for it was uh, Bryce uh Bryson Stott has already sat against two left-handed pitchers so between that and what I think is a steals upside disparity yeah I think Jimenez needs to be ahead of Bryson Stott and finally I moved Michael King down to 49th which is still must roster territory I'm not advising anyone to drop Michael King he's coming off his best start so far but even in that good start not many strikeouts not many swinging strikes I was skeptical of the strikeouts anyway because as good as he was with the move to rotation last year, he still wasn't getting many swinging strikes. Also the velocity, which held steady with his move to the rotation last year has been down this year. And I, I just don't, I think he'll be fine. I think he'll be a pretty good fantasy pitcher, but I don't, I don't think the upside is as high as uh, maybe the initial ranking would have suggested it was. So I moved him behind, uh, I think I moved him behind, like, uh, certainly Jared Jones and, and Reed Detmers, but also, like, Jack Flaherty, and I think behind Gavin Stone, too. Some, somewhere in that same range, at least. Yep. And we spoke a lot about Carlos Rodon the other day. He was one of Chris's followers at SP39. I'm just now realizing that we have, uh, or I mostly have, done a pretty bad time timing-wise today on the podcast, so there's still a lot to get to. Let's keep things moving. I yeah. uh, did want to mention some eligibility uh, position eligibility things that I just noticed throughout the ranking process. Bogarts now has second base. Henry Davis, obviously, as catcher. Jake Berger gained first base. Colt Keith gained second base. Michael Bush gained first. And Christopher Morell now has third base on CBS. Major League debuts on Wednesday. Jackson Holiday was batting ninth in his debut. He went 0 for 4 with his first RBI uh, and had two strikeouts. Did you guys move Holiday up with his promotion? Yep, 15th, as I alluded to earlier, just behind Anthony Volpe. It may sound low, but ahead of those two for me are Dansby Swanson and Xander Bogarts, who, of course, have very high floors. Could argue Holiday has a higher ceiling than both, maybe, and Volpe, too. But, uh, you know, there, there, there could be some growing pains there, as young as he is. I, I've got... Holiday 16th and Volpe 15th. And I'm wondering who I have. Hmm. Willie Adams. You don't. Do you have Willie Adams? No. Carlos in... Correa? No. Just keep guessing names. Uh yeah, I have to get Xander Bogart, Stansby Swanson, Hassan Kim. I'm this is very confusing. <laughs> I'll I try to what's happening right now. I'll try yeah. to figure it out. Oh, I think it might be. Oh, have it's you added Mookie? 
It's a yeah. dominant. Scott hasn't added Mookie Betts. You haven't added Scott. Mookie Betts. He's shortstop eligible. Yeah, that's yeah. what well, it is. Okay. You also have Adama as ahead of them, according to uh, in Roto. No, in head to head. Yeah, in head to head makes even less sense. Right. Yeah. Uh, Adama is yeah. I guess maybe. I don't know. Okay. All right, adjustments we'll be making after this podcast. On the <laughs> uh, it was a rough go for Spencer Araghetti in his Major League debut at the Royals. Three innings, seven hits, seven runs, three walks, three strikeouts. Uh, it was mostly four-seam fastball, cutter, and sweeper. He averaged around 95 miles per hour. Chris, any takeaways here on Spencer Araghetti's Major League debut? Uh, it was bad. <laughs> it was bad. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I, I didn't dig too much into it just because the results were so bad that I don't think anybody's at risk of adding him. And, and, you know, we said yesterday, basically, if he has a good start, go ahead and add him, but he didn't. So I, I don't think there's much reason to, uh, like the stuff seems fine. I haven't seen any like breakdowns of, of where it ranks, but yeah, because it was such an, an underwhelming start. I, I think you can probably just ignore him. Let's talk about the struggles of Tanner Bybee and Nolan Jones early on in the season. Tanner Bybee here struggled against the White Sox of all teams. Four and a third innings, five runs allowed, more walks than strikeouts, three walks to two strikeouts in that one. And uh, the fastball remains down early on. I just think control is lacking and the velocity being down. It's kind of what's led to this slow start here for Tanner Bybee. Scott, any actual concern? It looks like Bybee will line up for two starts next week. Is he just a slam dunk? Keep him in your lineup for now. I, I I think so. Unless your pitching staff is just stacked, it's it's frustrating more than anything because he had a combined eight walks against the Athletics and the White Sox. Mm -hmm. Two lineups he should have dominated, but he just wasn't throwing strikes. He had zero walks against the Twins, and it was a pretty good start. And we saw this from Bybee last year, curiously, because control was arguably his biggest selling point as a prospect. And I don't know, Zach Gallon's career kind of started out the same way, where he mm -hmm. uh, was walking more guys than you'd expect, given his minor league profile. And he eventually got it under control. And I'm, I'm hopeful Bybee does too, sooner than later. Nolan Jones went over five with three strikeouts here on Wednesday. And I know people are uh, clamoring for us to talk about Nolan Jones. He is batting a cool 157, zero homers, 481 OPS with a 40% strikeout rate. Chris, I did some more digging on Nolan Jones. He's still hitting the ball hard. And you look at the underlying plate discipline metrics. His zone contact is actually way up from last year. Uh -huh. His being strike rate is actually much better than it was last season. I understand the frustrations if you used a, you know, top five or six round pick on Nolan Jones, but some of the stuff under the hood actually looks pretty encouraging for Nolan Jones. Yeah, he's being too passive right now, I think is probably the problem. His zone swing rate is 51%. That's way too low. You're letting too many strikes go by. You're letting what I would assume are too many hittable balls go by, and, and you shouldn't do that because he... Mm -hmm. has faced 65% fastballs. This shouldn't be the issue for Nolan Jones. But but look, like people are clamoring for us to talk about him. What would you like us to say? He was a top 100 pick. We're not going to tell you to drop him. We're not. Like I'm I if that's what you are tuning in for to us to hear us say, we are not going to tell you to drop Nolan Jones. So if you want to drop Nolan Jones, Make that decision on your own. I'm not going to bless it, unfortunately. So I think he is highly likely to figure it out. Less likely than most other top 100 picks who have actual track records that go longer than the five months he was good last year for. But still, if I invested a top 100 pick in Nolan Jones, there's just no way I'm dropping him right now. So the, that's the all. Hul the Julio Jones anxiety was beginning Rodriguez. in my timeline. Julio Jones? <laughs> he's got the falcons the julio on the rodriguez, brain i am 40 uh, <laughs> the julio rodriguez anxiety was beginning in my timeline again for the third straight year and it you, you just like I, I i don't know why we i don't know why we have to have the same conversations every year you know particularly for him it's been and and like in the same pattern and I, I i i challenged one of the guys who was questioning me on it i'm like 
what what where do you think this is ultimately going to end up really like seriously mm -hmm. on uh, being honest with yourself where and he said oh he's going to hit 210 with 15 home runs i was like i i don't believe you actually believe that i think you're just venting and i think that's what it is i think it's just people right, like that, that's they want us to acknowledge that it's happening okay nolan jones pain. is no nolan jones is struggling and that sucks for your teams it sucks for a bunch of my teams. He's one of my most drafted players. So like, it's not good that he's struggling, but like, and it's not even like Corbin Carroll, where at least there's that shoulder issue from last year and the power outage that happened as a result of that. Like we talked about yesterday, where you can at least like, there is something tangible. You could conceivably be worried about there. There's nothing with Nolan Jones or Julio Rodriguez. So there we talked about them. And I just want to remind everybody that you signed up to play fantasy baseball. This is a six month season. Mm -hmm. So if Nolan Jones had a 10 game stretch in the middle of July, where I he, promise you he did. Yes. Where he hit this bad. And then, you know, he went on to have a great August and September. It's not guaranteed to happen. We're acknowledging that these players are struggling, but we need to be patient. It's a really, really long season. So let's just remind ourselves of that. Some leftovers here from Wednesday. Uh, Aaron Nola turned in a quality start at the Cardinals. Six innings, two runs, three strikeouts in that one. Velocity was way down, way down. It was also 57 degrees and raining in St. Mm -hmm. Louis. Dylan Cease turned in back-to-back uh, -back quality starts. This one against the Cubs. Six innings, two unearned runs with seven strikeouts. And the opposite of Aaron Nola, his velocity was way up. He averaged 97.2 miles per hour on the fastball. He maxed out at nearly 100 on that fastball. Cutter Crawford, solid against the Orioles. Five shutout innings, two hits, four walks, six strikeouts with 14 swinging strikes. In that one, he's looked pretty damn good early on in the season. And Jordan Hicks has also looked great. Back-to-back uh, -back quality starts for him. Six innings, one run, two strikeouts. He has a total of three walks through three starts. Will he maintain that? I do not know. Scott, anything to add on Hicks, Cutter Crawford, Dylan Cease, Aaron Nola? Uh, so the Nola velocity being down as much as it was is not unconcerning, but I will point out it was, it was 50 to 7 degrees, which is cold for baseball. It was also like drizzly as I understand it. And and Lance Lynn's velocity was down quite a bit too. I just I just don't think it was normal conditions. And I think both pitchers did a good job of navigating that whole situation. Um I'm just going by weather forecast I saw. I don't I didn't actually see the highlights to confirm it was drizzly. So if I'm wrong about that, sorry. No, it was. It, okay. it, it looked terrible there. Okay, yeah. Uh and and Nola's velocity was down more like it was down a little last time too, but that was mm -hmm. in 48 degree weather. So I, I think Nola is going to be fine. I think his velocity is going to get back to normal within a few starts and, and this will not be an issue for long. Uh, so that was my main takeaway from that group. I did want to say for one other pitcher, it was Jordan Hicks. You know, he's, he's not, he's, he's, he's getting great results. He's not missing any bats. Everything is down five miles per hour. Mm -hmm. I, I have to think it's by design. I have to think it's by design. Oh, yeah. He's so good at getting weak contact on the ground that that's just what he's going for. And he's avoiding walks and it's, it's going pretty well. I'd like to see more strikeouts. That splitter is a pretty good swing and miss pitch that new splitter he has. Um, But I'm kind of torn on how I feel about him right now. Yeah, he is where I have him ranked relative to relief pitchers would be around SP 60 to 65. Uh, Cause he's not SP eligible this year so far. Um, but two more starts, three more starts, something like that. Um, yeah. I think five total two so more. needs yeah. two more starts. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, that I, I think he's useful. I don't think he's an ACE all of a sudden, but I think he'll be good. And he's another one where at some point we'll have to have the conversation about how many innings will he yeah. actually be allowed to throw this season, but he's off to a great start. And I have to imagine the giants told him, look, man, you've got nasty stuff. Just pump strikes and let's see what happens yeah. from there. And 
so far so good with uh, Jordan Hicks. Hitters who are off to solid starts, wanted to quickly mention these five names because we haven't really talked much about them, but Adolis Garcia, Lourdes Gurriel, Jake Cronenworth, and that's right, Chris. John Carlos Stanton hit his fourth home run of the season. He also has a 36% strikeout rate to start the year. Who <laughs> cares? Um, I thought it was 40. 36? Okay. He might have lowered it after after this game, but yeah, I think the one that's most notable, Chris, is Jake Cronenworth because he's batting in the middle of the Padres lineup and mm -hmm. he's hitting the ball really hard early on. The expected numbers are just jumping off yep. the page. I don't think he will maintain that exactly, but this is a very encouraging start for him. Yeah, I think that's all right. He's it's an encouraging start. He's unlikely to sustain anything like this uh, quality of contact, but I, I think you know, a low to mid 800s OPS is within the realm of possibility on the high end and in the middle of a good lineup that can, that can be a very good thing. So I think, yeah, Cronoworth is a, a very solid starting option for fans. I will, right I will say that among infielders, he was, he, he made the biggest move up my rankings, Jake Cronenworth. I now have him in my top 20 at second base ahead of Colt Keith and Edward Julian, actually. Uh, he, one of one of the home runs he hit, I think, was his hardest hit ball in three years. Mm. And his expected stats are much better than the actual ones. Even he's he's mm -hmm. I don't know what changed for him, but I think something did change for Jake Cronenworth. All right. Um bullpen updates for the twins. Brock Stewart got the seventh inning with a one run lead, facing nine, one, and two in the Dodgers lineup. Griffin Jacks then pitched the eighth inning, facing four, five, and six. And Steven Okert got the ninth and converted his first save of the season. We mentioned this recently. It looks like it's kind of matchup yeah. three headed monster until Yoan Duran is back. So uh, unfortunately, you know, if anyone else has emerged recently that you're more excited to pick up like a James MacArthur, I, I think I'd probably drop any of the twins relievers for James MacArthur. I guess. Yeah. All right. Uh, for the Phillies, it was Jeff Hoffman who once again got the ninth inning with a one-run lead, converted his first save, and Jose Alvarado, nowhere to be found, was not used anywhere in this game. He has not pitched since Monday, and it feels like Jose Alvarado should have been available. Did you guys see anything as to why he didn't pitch? No, I haven't seen anything about it. I didn't see anything. He, he's, yeah, he had, he had just gotten a day off. He had worked three of five days so maybe they were looking to give him an extended rest but but yeah i don't know um it's a little it's a little uh hard to figure out what's going on with the phillies bullpen i i, I think alvarado is still the guy to have but they're they're mixing and matching for sure and it sounds like orion kirkering could be yeah. back soon too so just i don't think they're gonna throw him right into the ninth inning but no. if they use him in the seventh and and he pitches well for a while then Maybe he can earn some saves. Mm -hmm. It's not crazy. For the I was, I was looking into something that thing I said about Cronenworth. He actually has two balls this year already harder hit than in the previous two years. There were both doubles, though. They, no home runs. All right. For the D-backs, Kevin Ginkle got the ninth with a two-run lead. He gave up a hit and two walks, but picked up his second save. For the Rays, Pete Fairbanks got the ninth inning with a two-run lead, allowed a hit, but struck out three for his second save. For the Marlins, they finally had a normal save situation late in the game. Anthony Bender got the eighth inning with a two-run lead. He gave up a hit, a walk, and a run. He was relieved by Tanner Scott, who recorded the final five outs for his first save. He also walked three. Yeah. It was a Tanner Scott experience. But mm -hmm. seeing this, it I guess it is a reminder that he is actually still the closer. So that's yeah. good news for Definitely. Him. Uh, for the Orioles, Craig Kimbrell got the ninth inning with a two-run lead. He struck out two for his second save. To stream or not to stream for Thursday. And I think Garrett Whitlock against the Orioles is pretty good. Ranger Suarez against the Pirates. And John Gray against the A's. <laughs> sure. That, uh, that, that sounds like the three I'd choose in the same order. All right. And then on Friday... Looking up and down the list, uh, Paul Blackburn against the Nationals is kind of interesting. Uh, Maeda against the Twins, they're striking out a ton. Ooh, revenge like game for him, too. He's looked. Oh, he's been terrible, but. And, and like 
not just the results have been terrible. He, he has not looked good. The velocity's been down. Severino against the Royals? That could yeah, be okay. that's the one. That's yeah, the one. that one's okay. Um, I don't think this will work out well, but I am interested just to see how D.L. Hall pitches at the Orioles. That's a pretty fun game. I'm interested in that one, but he's been really unimpressive so far. The stuff has not looked particularly good. We'll see what happens with Ryan Feltner coming off that 10 strikeout game. My sense is to ignore it, but it was a 10 strikeout game. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. Andrew Abbott at the White Sox too. I mean, I just think anybody against the White Sox did. Who's your just top three for Friday, I guess. Severino against the Royals. Andrew Abbott at the White Sox and Paul Blackburn against the Nationals. Yep. I, I, think, I that's think that's right. Yeah. We're going to wrap there for Scott and Chris. I am Frank. Thanks as always for tuning in to fantasy baseball today. Please make sure to follow and leave a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify. And we will be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.